Good afternoon and welcome to a special live Hudson Institute event. I'm Ken Weinstein, the Walter P. Stern Distinguished Fellow at Hudson Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome Congressman French Hill, a member of the House Committee on Financial Services to Hudson Institute, for a discussion on how can the World Bank and the IMF assist Ukraine. As the World Bank and IMF meetings uh, take place uh, this week in Washington, we're delighted to have Congressman Hill with us today to discuss how the U.S. and its allies can provide increased international development assistance to a cash-strapped Ukraine under Russian invasion. Congressman Hill is a well-known voice on these issues in Washington and around the world. He's now in his fourth term in Congress. He served previously at the Department of Treasury and also at the White House, and in particular, he helped design economic relief packages for newly emerging post-communist societies after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Congressman, it's a real pleasure to have you with us. Well, Ken, it's great to be with you. I appreciate the invitation. And this is such a timely and important topic uh, as the IMF and World Bank gather in Washington and the G20 today to talk about the future of pro-Ukraine. Uh, our conversation's important. First, let me say that I look at this through the, uh, the lens of uh, that work I did 30 years ago uh, on behalf of President H.W. Bush uh, in looking at financial assistance into Central Europe. It's amazing now to go back and see the success of those economies that uh, dumped the shackles of the Iron Curtain and adopted uh, free market principles and strong democracies on their own right. And so when you travel to Warsaw uh, compared to 1989 and 1990, uh, you're flabbergasted by the absolute uh, beauty of the city and the investment made by the Poles and the success. So that makes this uh, action by Putin in Ukraine such in stark contrast from the hope that we all had three decades ago when we were counting on Poland, Hungary, uh, the Czech Republic, and others to become the Asian tigers of the 2000s. We really had a lot of economic and political hopes for the region. And those much, much of that has been achieved, but it's in jeopardy now as Putin uh, attempts to systematically destroy Ukraine. The second prism that I use in looking at this is Putin's own modus operandi for the past 22 years. He's a destroyer of everything he touches from Grozny and Chechnya to Northern Georgia to his co-conspiratorship uh, in Syria with Assad and mass murder. And so it should be no surprise to people that he's taking the action he's taken in Ukraine. The sad thing is that uh, the West was uh, taken in shock or off guard by this, uh, not by everybody in the West. Many of us have been warning about uh, this action for years. And certainly since uh, Putin waltzed into Crimea without firing a shot back in 2014, uh, this next inevitable Grozny Aleppo step was a real reality. So uh, let's talk a little bit uh, about uh, reconstruction and rebirth. Janet Yellen spoke earlier in the week and she rightly uh, described those meetings uh, in Bretton Woods in New Hampshire talking about the international monetary future. Uh, those meetings were held just a month after D-Day. And so the allies were thinking about the future, knowing then that they'd won in Europe. This week we gather in Washington, not knowing if we're going to win or not in Ukraine. And I think that's uh, a, a cloud that overhangs uh, the meetings, but I'm glad to be with you and look forward to our discussion. Well, that's a, that's a very rich uh, answer, uh, Congressman. Let me let me ask you, when you look at what you did 30 years ago, you were a young man. I mean, you, uh, period, being given this huge assignment by uh, President uh, George H.W. Bush. What, what do you think worked best? And, we're, we're, and, and if you had to criticize yourself 30 years later, where, you know, where, where do you think, where, the, where were the shortcomings? I do so in order to think about how to think about the challenge we're now facing. Well, it was a multilateral effort when the Berlin Wall fell, and the emphasis of the Treasury was in Central Europe. It was not per se about the efforts in the former Soviet republics. So we were focused on from Poland in the north on the Baltic down to Bulgaria on the Black Sea. Our approach was first uh, make sure that 
market laws, the uh, uh, rule of law, private property rights were enshrined in new constitutions and new laws, and that capital markets were put in place, accounting systems, that bankers after 40 years of uh, poor education were given new life and new training about how to do things in a market-based economy, not a centrally planned economy. That was a cultural shift. We didn't have physical decay per se in those countries, but we had moral and educational de decay uh, from World War II until 1989. And so a lot of our effort was there. Where that privatization, rule of law, and capital market system was quickly and promptly adopted, you see amazing benefits. You can look at Poland and you can look at the Czech Republic uh, to see that. The same to some degree also in Hungary. But uh, other countries struggled to maintain that rule of law, make sure there was no uh, corruption endemic in their system. And I just got back from Romania and uh, Bucharest, as well as our troops uh, down at MK Air Base. And I reflected that Bucharest today looks uh, very similar to the way it looked, uh, unfortunately, 30 years ago. And I was reminded, even under freedom, they haven't built a new highway since uh, Ceausescu was assassinated. So it does take all those things to have a, uh, a functioning, successful market economy. Very, very, very interesting. Let, let me... Let me also ask you about, you talked about Putin's modus operandi and, and the uncertainty that hangs over uh, the, what is going to be a massive rebuilding effort, a rebuilding effort we haven't seen in Europe, certainly, obviously, since World War II. Uh, as, as we, as we, we st and just simply, I guess there, 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 I guess there are really two questions I have. The first question is, on the short term short to medium term, what can the, can the U.S. do and what can the international financial institutions do to provide uh, assistance to Ukraine at this dire moment? And uh, that's the first question. Well, uh, first, we have to make sure that uh, Ukraine can maintain a functioning economy and every place that's not under direct siege by the Russians and direct destruction of the Russians. We wanna to try to see that economic system, that social system, the civil government functioning as best as possible. So the European Union, uh, allied nations, uh, the G7, all have at their heart financial assistance, intermediate financial assistance to Ukraine for that functioning government, that balance of payments. And the World Bank, uh, the IMF, uh, and those bilateral donors all can play a role there. We voted, for example, in Congress to suspend all payments uh, by the multilateral uh, agencies uh, for Ukraine to give them breathing room. Uh, they'll also need uh, structural assistance, even in this short period of time. So not related to rebuilding, but just maintaining their government structure now. That's number one right this minute. It, 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 it's, I mean, when you, and when you look... You look at the situation and you look at this. Let me ask you about the Ukrainian government, first of all, and the reforms that Zelensky has take, undertaken in terms of their ability to handle some of these economic issues. Obviously, on the security side, it's a massive change from 2014. We look at uh, the way they're, they're, they're fighting, the, the, the courage of the Ukrainian people, the sense of national unity. But the, the challenge of corruption inside Ukraine has been a massive challenge uh, for governance. It's been a massive challenge uh, for, 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 for businesses trying to operate there. What's your sense of things now? Uh, wh where are they headed? And, and, and what does this mean for the, for the potential rebuilding effort? Zelensky and the uh, parliament have an amazing opportunity to collaborate now to come out of this crisis with a sound rule of law, private property rights, uh, proper government uh, engagement in the uh, economy. And I'm optimistic about that. This has been a stark reminder of what works right and what has worked wrong. And I have every confidence that uh, the central bank and the finance ministry, uh, the IMF, the World Bank, uh, the EU can all collaborate. Look, Zelensky wants to join the West. They don't want to be a vassal state of the Russians. They want to reject all those bad habits of Russian intervention and Russian corruption and the, uh, I'd say the legacies of the 1990s and move forward. And they can do that with support from uh, 
the G7 and the EU. And I, I have confidence that that can, that can happen. Yeah, the EU membership looks like a real possibility uh, as of now. That, and that comes with strong sticks. You don't get EU financial support uh, if you maintain, uh, you know, significant uh, failures on the corruption uh, and budgeting and budgeting oversight and accountability. And there are some existing Central European countries uh, that we won't name here that have suffered and don't have the kind of su uh, financial support that they could have if they continue to improve their uh, central government functions. Let me, let's shift gears a little bit. Let me ask you about the damages uh, in Ukraine, the critical areas to rebuild as you start to think about uh, uh, this massive effort. How do you start to think about what to do first? Uh, th there's so much infrastructure that's been destroyed. So many homes have been destroyed. Obviously, we know of the millions of refugees living living abroad, some of whom you, you saw in your trips to both uh, when you were in Poland and Romania last week. Well, this is a colossal uh, project. I think all the estimates I've read from the uh, geopolitical insurance company estimates uh, and others are sorely understated. Uh, Ken, I went back and looked at two places that were obliterated uh, during the Yugoslavian wars, Sarajevo and Kosovo. And if you inflation adjust uh, Sarajevo by itself after the NATO bombing campaign and related destruction, it's in the $320 billion range in 2022 dollars, uh, just uh, that one location, Kosovo, something in the $50 billion in 2022 dollars. So these estimates I've seen that could approach a trillion dollars in Ukraine uh, based on Russian destruction, uh, that, that to me, that could be possible, easily possible based on what we're seeing. And it's critical in the rebuilding that we focus on logistics, we focus on the agricultural sector, the industrial sector, because that's where a lot of expensive infrastructure in the East will have been damaged. Our ports uh, are critical, but 60% of the Ukrainian economy is still in services. So finding ways to support small business uh, is going to be an immense task. Uh, so, First, damage assessment, as you point out, and the United Nations and Europe and the Ukrainians themselves will lead that effort in doing that analysis. The UN satellite photography that you see uh, routinely uh, noted in their weekly reports indicates building damaging, industrial damage uh, from uh, that kind of scanning. That'll be key, uh, but it's going to be an hands on deck of everybody. And that's why this idea the polls have put forward of a donor conference, I think is the key first step. And let me, and let me, let me ask you, you're, you, you represent Arkansas fourth district, it's Little Rock and it's suburbs primarily. Uh, what's your, what's, when you talk to constituents, are they concerned about how to, who's gonna pay for this? Are you, what, what concerns are you hearing when, when you talk to Ukraine with your constituents? Well, people are in shock. They're not unlike uh, citizens in Brussels or Warsaw or Vienna who can't believe that Putin actually did this. Even though, as I argue for 22 years, this is precisely the Putin playbook. I know it flabbergasts uh, hardworking Americans and hardworking uh, Parisians uh, that he's actually done this. And it's not off in some faraway place. It's actually on the borders of Western Europe. So their shock is number one, Ken. Secondly, yesterday at the Rotary Club of Little Rock, there was a spectacular presentation by a young man here in Sherwood, Arkansas, who's married to a Ukrainian, who has taken it upon himself with his in-laws to feed Ukrainians in Ukraine. And he has created a supply chain coming from Arkansas and from America to support that effort. And he's back there helping uh, his wife's families, uh, national citizens, weather this storm. So Americans have uh, jumped in, I think, to the fray by billions of dollars and, and millions of hours in humanitarian support. No, it's, it's, it's really been extraordinary to see, and Americans aren't alone, but it's really been remarkable to see the depth of uh, the volunteerism, the, the donations and the like. Uh, but as, as we both know, that 
as important as these efforts are to keep people alive, to feed them, to clothe them, to house them, uh, it's nowhere near what's going to be needed on this, uh, you know, talking trillion dollar plus sums to, to rebuild places like Mariupol and, and the like. It's, 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 it's a massive challenge. And uh, I, I guess sort of there's, you know, you, you, on Twitter, you hear the easy answer, which is, well, let's just take money from the Russian kleptocrats and, and uh, take, you know, t- t- seize Russian assets. That, that, I mean, it's, it's a nice political talking point. Uh, I, I'm skeptical that it's going to be able to pay for much. What's, what's your thoughts on, 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 on that? And, and uh, uh, you know, how do we finance these efforts? Right. Well, when you look at uh, tradition from the past, you have the concept of war reparations. Uh, that involves having a peace conference and having a decision. And you and I have trouble right now uh, seeing how that's going to go. Uh, we do have the issue of frozen assets in the past, uh, we have taken frozen assets from bad actors and distributed them from other purposes. Most recently, the controversy in President uh, Biden's decision about some of the frozen Afghan assets, uh, partially for victims and partially for rebuilding. We had the oil for food program after the invasion of Iraq. So I do think uh, Russian assets, uh, Russian revenues will be a source of funds for the rebuilding. And we'll just have to wait and see how that uh, progresses and to what scale it would be and over what period of years, a critical uh, diplomatic and economic policy issue. Secondly, as I say, Europeans uh, want to unite uh, for their fellow Europeans in Ukraine, both on the equity uh, capital side and on the lending side. And then finally, the multilateral process, the G20 Uh, and the international financial institutions have to be engaged. I believe the Ukrainians have to take the lead on thinking this through. President Zelensky gave a great talk uh, earlier this week about um, the rebirth and rebuilding of his country and his vision for uh, really finally bringing uh, the Ukrainian cities up to standard uh, through this. And so it was a very optimistic. Congressman, we've lost you there for a second. Uh, you're, you're frozen on us. Let's see if you unfreeze. Let me see if you unfreeze on us. Okay, we're going to see if you come back in. Okay, we're going to see about having the congressman rejoin us and minor technical challenge of going live on zoom but we'll have the congressman back up in a second okay we were just chatting about the role of uh, the international financial institutions and the G20 in rebuilding uh, what will have to be a massive rebuilding effort, God willing, once this war comes to an end. And so looking forward to having Congressman uh, French Hill be with us. He's logging back in now as we speak. And so it's it's been a very insightful conversation uh, uh, by the Congressman so far. Looking forward to having more of his insights with us uh, here at Hudson Institute uh, momentarily. And just as a reminder on the Congressman's background that uh, as I noted, he represents the fourth district, the second district of uh, Little Rock and its suburbs. He, this is his fourth term in Congress. Uh, from 1989 to 91, he served as uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Treasury for Corporate Finance. After the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall, as uh, was noted, he led the design of US technical assistance to the emerging economies of Eastern and Central Europe in the areas of banking and security. And uh, in 1991, President uh, George H.W. Bush appointed him to be executive secretary to the President's Economic Policy Council, where he coordinated all White House economic policy. Uh, Before being elected to Congress, he was the founder, chairman, and chief executive officer of the Little Rock-based Delta Trust and Banking Corporation, which subsequently merged with Arkansas-based uh, Simmons 
first national corporation. And he is uh, apparently having some electrical challenges at his house, but it's, it's been a very interesting conversation. A man who has been both a, a practitioner in the financial sector, uh, member of Congress from uh, uh, for now for four terms and uh, someone who is, uh, travels widely uh, in both uh, inter and international financial circles and very well regarded here in Washington on both sides of the aisle for a very substantive uh, agenda in Congress, uh, including a focus uh, as we'll hear on uh, uh, the challenge to, uh, posed uh, by both uh, China and Russia's presence uh, in the international financial institutions at the World Bank and the IMF, which uh, we'll get into momentarily. So uh, please stay with us. Uh, as uh, the conversation continues that uh, period. I know the Congressman was very much looking forward to being with us and I was very much uh, looking forward to the opportunity to uh, uh, have him address these critical issues. So I'm sure he'll be back uh, within a moment or two. So, um, I'm sure that he'll be right back with us momentarily. He had just, the Congressman had just returned as he noted from a trip to uh, NATO bases in both Poland and Romania. He also had the opportunity to travel in both countries and to interact with uh, uh, refugees uh, in both, uh, with Ukrainian refugees, both in Poland and in Romania. And one of the interesting things that he noted was uh, that he was very pleased to see a flow of refugees going back into Ukraine, uh, and that this was a very positive development, that he didn't see the huge lines of, of, of uh, Ukrainians seeking to flee uh, the country, but that they were returning. And uh, he also noted uh, before our conversation, uh, the special role that uh, Moldova, that uh, Romania plays in Moldova, that uh, Moldovans, uh, many have uh, dual citizenship with Romania, and that Romania acts as a correct sort of as a protector for uh, Moldovan citizens. There's a congressman, he's back with us. Well, sorry about that. No, all good. We had a, we had a uh, thunderstorm hit here and all the power in my neighborhood just went out. Wow, wow, okay, well that was- But the uh, power of technology is available to us, Ken. It's incredible that you're able to get back on, wow. Well, thank you for coming back on. You, we just started talking, you just started talking about the role of the, uh, of the, the G20, the IMF, and the World Bank in the rebuilding effort, and wanted to get your sense of how, what they ought to focus on, uh, what the challenges are, and also you've been open about this, about Russia's role and China's role in these, in these institutions that, and, and, and the challenges that they, they pose. Well, this is uh, a key issue, and it's, uh, there's a lot of unanimity around this in Congress that uh, bad actors should not have access to uh, the disproportionate powers and privileges of our international financial institutions. And yet, look, here's the facts. We have a P5 member, a member of the Security Council, a permanent member of the Security Council attacking a sovereign government, sovereign country, and trying to destroy it. So the whole balance inside our international system is off. I know Janet Yellen's proposing to boycott, as are her other six colleagues from the G7, the G20 meeting. But we are scoring victories uh, in the General Assembly by holding Russia account. We've set up an independent inquiry there for war crimes. Uh, we have thrown them out of the Human Rights Council. So this is hard work, and we need to do the hard work of uh, in the same way inside the G20 and inside the uh, governance bodies for the World Bank and the IFI. Uh, no one said it would be easy, but America has the clout to do this. Uh, for example, uh, we are proposing that Belarus and Russia have no access to the IMF and no access to uh, using their special drawing rights. They're very important IMF uh, uh, assets that they could use for collateral or they could use to make payments. Uh, they could use to secure a loan, for example, to someone who's not complying with the sanctions, like another permanent uh, Security Council member, China, potentially might be. I'm not saying that's the case now, uh, but uh, it is a concern, I think, of, of the Western democracies that somehow China would finance uh, Russia's malfeasance here 
off uh, the balance sheet using gold or SDRs as, as collateral. So we need to have that leadership uh, in those institutions and, and not allow these rogue actors continued privileges of membership at the, I, at the IFIs. Let me ask you about the special drawing rights that Russia and Moldova have. How much, how much any sense of what the, the sums might be? I know you've introduced legislation to prohibit uh, uh, Russia from getting, having access to its SDRs. Is, do you have a dollar amount on it? And, and also, where, where is the legislation standing now? Uh, the legislation passed the House committee unanimously, and my colleagues uh, over in the Senate have, in, have uh, also in, uh, introduced it, Rick Scott of Florida. So we, we've got unanimity bipartisan to pass this. But here's the point about SDRs. I've warned for two years not to do what's called a general allocation of SDRs. That's the easy way out. It means all 190 countries in the IMF get their proportionate share of these very valuable capital reserve assets. So even Assad gets $400 million worth. The Russians just last summer got $19 billion worth of SDRs, and that's about 70% of their total SDR uh, amount, meaning we just gave it to them a year ago when we knew of the direction. So I support the IMF doing the hard job which is doing a special allocation, which requires an amendment to the IMF process. But it would allow the IMF to only deliver SDRs to the poorest countries in the world that have suffered a balance of payments and, and a, a GDP fall due to the pandemic to give them some additional resources. Secondly, I do support uh, wealthy countries like European countries of the United States transferring some of their SDRs to the Poverty Reduction Fund at the IMF, also to benefit those poorest countries, uh, those 70 countries that have had their debt payments suspended due to the pandemic. But look, Janet Yellen did not ask that that be done in advance of last summer's allocation. So there's been really meaningless uh, follow-up on that. Uh, and instead, she bet on this common framework where all the debt suspension would be coordinated uh, through the IMF but that in the G20, but that has not been successful either. So we need to cut Russia and Belarus and other bad actors off access to the fund, and we need a mechanism to do that that's uh, a lot more nimble and flexible than this uh, current state of play we have at the IMF, which is everything's either a general allocation benefiting every member or it's not. I know you've expressed some doubts about uh, uh, the head of my, the IMF, uh, Christina Georgieva, uh, and her abilities. Uh, uh, you, you, you've, you've questioned uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen about uh, inquiries into Georgieva's leadership. Uh, how, how do you see that as a challenge for uh, the IMF? Well, the IMF, uh, again, uh, is governed by its board of directors, and our managing director serves at the pleasure of that board of directors. And there have been a number of instances in the last few months where members of Congress on both sides of the aisle and both sides of the Capitol have raised questions about the current managing director's leadership style and capability of leading the fund at this time, based on some decisions that she made previously when she was at the World Bank. And I believe that Congress should get answers to those questions. And my uh, question to Secretary Yellen was very straightforward. Do you still have every confidence uh, that uh, she can lead the IMF at this critical time and that she has the credibility to do that? I think that's an open question. And I think Congress should uh, uh, have that answered to their satisfaction. One of the issues that's been raised about the managing director was uh, uh, her relationship with uh, China. Uh, and just wondering, your concerns also, you've raised your concerns about uh, Russia quite openly, uh, your concerns about China's role in the international financial institutions and, and, and uh, what, the, what, the, uh, what we need to do also uh, to uh, uh, push to... Uh, bring China into compliance in, in a whole bunch of uh, multilateral areas? China is being treated like on autopilot. Uh, mm -hmm. 
first principle going back to our whole career that we've shared in public life. We thought that uh, by setting high standards and holding China to account that they would join the family uh, of nations in every way, diplomatically and economically, while they grew their economy and benefited the living standards of uh, the Chinese people. And for a couple of decades, I would say there were really strong efforts there. Uh, but during the Obama administration, uh, under President Xi, uh, that has turned and taken a very negative tag. Uh, and they are no longer acting as a responsible uh, member of the family of nations. So when I say autopilot, I mean, well, they're now a large economy. So they should have their shareholdership reflect that at the uh, World Bank or at the IMF. They're a large global economy. They now have more a current account surplus, extra funding, so they should now fund the priorities of the UN. I would argue like so many things in life, it's not how much money you have, it's what's your moral standing. And China's moral standing and legitimate standing in these institutions needs to be earned. It's not automatic because their economy has grown to be uh, the second largest uh, in the world. Secondly, they are using that clout to infiltrate both in the United Nations and in the multilateral lending process and dominate that. Think about this, Ken. Uh, the old Paris Club, the principal sovereign lenders of the world since World War II, have had their uh, lending around the world cut by a third. China has picked up much of that slack, but it's not transparent. China is not a member of the Paris Club. China has countries sign non-disclosure agreements not to share what the collateral or pricing on the credit is in its pernicious terms. And so uh, if China wants these benefits of being a leader in society, then they need to join the Paris Club. They need to not have non-disclosure arrangements for their sovereign lending and for their development lending. And I think, again, Janet uh, Yellen is our Treasury Secretary. The G7 finance ministers need to obtain that kind of leverage up front in writing from China before we go about granting more privileges, more loans, or another allocation of SDRs. And that's why my SDR Oversight Act would reform the process by which these reserve assets are, are issued. Terrific. Well, Congressman, it's been an absolute pleasure being with you today. Sorry about the little uh, technical glitch down there, thanks to the thunderstorm, but you, you got back on very quickly with us. Uh, no, it's been a real pleasure. You are, as I said earlier, a widely respected uh, figure on uh, these international financial issues and on other issues, and it's, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to have you with us here at Hudson Institute. Look forward to welcoming you back and uh, keep us posted on, uh, on the important work you're doing. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, Ken, thank you for the invitation. It was great to have this dialogue with you. We all appreciate the outstanding leadership, research, and positions uh, taken uh, by Hudson, and I look forward to seeing you in person next time. Thanks for the visit. Thank you so much, Congressman. Take care.